Thank you all for coming to this lecture about ecological economics. Uh, in the next 30 to 48 minutes, I will try to convince you, or hope to convince you all, that ecological economics is in fact a both interesting and important alternative to mainstream economics. But first, um, when it comes to environmental problems, uh, which is what ecological economics deals with, why not leave it up to ecologists or biologists or maybe other natural sciences, or maybe even engineers who can actually design more environmentally friendly technologies and come up with uh, better energy sources. How does a lone polar bear stuck on an ice sheet um, um, link with uh, the economy? And what does it apply for economics? First of all, climate change has very real impacts on our economies. Um, climate change causes um, large amounts of destruction um, of whole areas in some cases and um, to infrastructure and buildings and the places where people live. Environmental problems also have direct impacts on people and their well-being, um, both in terms of their daily lives, um, where you have certain areas where, um, with extremely high levels of pollution, or in terms of extreme events. So how does this relate to our actual economies? All of these environmental problems are related to the ways in which we produce and consume goods and services. It's related to the ways in which we get energy and the ways, um, this is a picture of tar sand, and the ways um, in which we uh, get materials for the production of goods and services. It's also um, more generally related to the ways in which we uh, live and the ways in which we organize society, uh, the ways that we move and the ways that we consume. But the environment is not just some problem that we have to deal with. Uh, the environment is what um, forms the basis of our economies and the things that we produce and buy. Nature provides, among other things, minerals, materials for buildings and infrastructure, water recycling, air purification, land, fossil fuels, food production, waste absorption, micro and micro climate regulation, medicines, pollination, and protection from solar and cosmic radiation. And this is not even including the more cultural, and recreational values of the environment um, and the value of just living in a nice and healthy environment. This picture um, is a picture from an article published in Nature in 2009. Um, 29 scientists went together to estimate the impacts of society on nature. And they tried to define the safe operating space or the planetary boundaries um, that we should stay within if we want to avoid uh, dangerous or unpredictable changes um, for nine different areas. Um, this picture um, tells us um, with the green circle um, the areas or the, the limits um, uh, that we should stay inside and the red wedges are the estimates of where we currently are. So not predictions but where we currently are. And as you can see we are approaching the boundaries for global freshwater use, land use change, ocean acidification, and interference with the phosphorus cycle. Also, as you can see, we've already passed the 
the boundaries for climate change, biodiversity loss, and interference with the nitrogen cycle. So, all of the environmental problems um, represented by the iconic polar bear um, have very real impacts on economies and people's well-being. On the other hand, these environmental processes also provide crucial materials, energy, and other services to the economy. Now, the questions are, how does economics as a field help us understand causes of environmental degradation? And how does economics help us identify solutions? And lastly, how is production conceptualized in relation to the environment? The response from mainstream economics to these growing environmental concerns um, over the last decades has been the subdiscipline of environmental economics. Um, importantly, environmental economics should be distinguished from ecological economics for reasons that I will tell you later on. Environmental economics um, is, is strictly a subdiscipline of neoclassical economics using the same um, theories and tools and based on the same assumptions. According to environmental economics, environmental problems are basically market failures. What this means is that a nature or natural resources are not priced adequately. Um, they usually have a price that's too low um, or even free. Um, and uh, industries and companies do not have to pay very much to use these resources. This leads to inefficiencies, um, which is basically market failures. And based on this understanding of environmental problems, solution becomes finding the correct price on nature or natural capital, um, which environmental economics usually what likes to call it. Um, and this is done either by including them in markets, uh, for instance, by uh, creating a market for carbon credits or for bio biodiversity offsets, or it's done by um, different forms of valuation methods that, that measures um, what people would be willing to pay for um, certain natural resources or um, ecosystem services. Um, typically, this could be a willingness to pay survey um, where um, people in an area are asked how much they would be willing to pay to protect uh, maybe a forest nearby. Um, then this, um, this could be added up and then compared to the profits that could be made by using this uh, area of forest for um, something else, um, uh, for instance, um, a new industry or some other development. The approach of environmental economics is basically um, guided by the goal of maximizing total sur social surplus, um, where um, including the value of nature in monetary terms. Uh, and it can therefore be seen as a branch of welfare economics. This approach can be pictured using um, this picture, um, where instead of um, largely ignoring uh, environmental services, um, uh, the environment is brought into the market or into the economy uh, by pricing the different goods and services that it provides. Now, ecological economics takes a fundamentally different approach. And this approach is uh, represented by uh, this well-known picture in, uh, within the field of ecological economics. Um, according to this picture, the economy should be seen as a subsystem of society which again is seen as a subsystem of the environment. This picture um, hints at at least 
two things that are important within ecological economics. First of all, there's a notion here of limits. The economy can only grow so much before it hits the limit um, of the environment. Um, another um, thing to get from this picture is that ecological economics does not only focus on the inner circle um, where um, the efficiency criteria is important. Ecological economics focuses also on the two other circles and the relationship between the economy and these two spheres. In addition to efficiency, ecological economics focuses on two additional but fundamental criteria. The first one is distributional questions and the second one is biophysical limits. Distributional questions are absolutely crucial to ecological economics and to environmental problems in general. This is because um, um, when we have environmental problems, the burdens are usually carried not by the people responsible for the uh, environmental problem, but typically by more poor communities or parts of the world. When it comes to environmental problems, and in particular climate change, this distributional question often also appears over time. Climate change, according to ecological economics, is primarily a problem about the fair distribution of rights and burdens between generations, as opposed to a question about the efficient distribution of resources. So, in other words, mainstream economics has one main criteria, which is efficiency. Ecological economics has three criteria, where efficiency um, comes only after the first two are met. Um, the first being living within biophysical limits, and the second one, um, making sure that distributional fairness is uh, met. I'm going to focus, um, since I only have so much time, on the first point, um, which is the biophysical limits. Um, Alicia will be talking about um, some aspects of distribution um, in her lecture later in the semester. So I have two takeaways from this lecture. Um, and the first one being that the scale of the economy has increased dramatically, which implies significant impacts on economies and people's well-being through environmental degradation, which I've already shown through some of the pictures. The second point is that mainstream economics does not sufficiently conceptualize or model the crucial dependency of the economy on nature. So, the problems in environmental economics um, are, are larger problems of mainstream economics in general. Um, and um, one of the famous um, pictures or conceptualizations in mainstream economics is this circular flow of goods and services and factors of production between households and firms, um, which are then um, uh, also um, shown uh, with the, the physical quantities on one hand and with the money flows on the other hand. Um, this picture is basically a, a closed system um, in which um, everything that goes from one part to the other uh, comes back in a different form. Um, from the other part to the, to the first part. Um, there's one thing missing from this picture, um, which is, according to ecological economics, absolutely crucial, and that is um, nature. Or, um, more specifically, the 
flows of material and energy uh, required to produce these goods and services, um, and then leaving this um, circle as uh, waste. Ecological economics therefore takes a more systemic approach to understanding the economy, specifically including physical flows of energy and natural resources. Um, where you have them coming in or being provided from the biosphere, um, being circulated through the economy, and then coming out as waste and pollution, um, some of this being recycled back. Thus, the ecological economics conceptualization or picture of the economy um, is depicts a, an open system rather than a closed system. Um, the circular flow in the first picture is seen uh, not as, as, as the only um, or the central focus, but just as one intermediate um, part of this whole process, um, which requires uh, one directional flow of energy and matter. So, this kind of approach, uh, or the point of this kind of approach, is to answer um, certain questions that um, uh, that are hard to answer using the tools of mainstream economics. Uh, and these types of questions could be: What happens when an infinite growth economy runs into a finite planet? The ways in which ecological economics answers or tries to answer these questions. Um, is by, uh, by taking into account um, uh, what the natural sciences have taught us about the contributions of nature to the creation of wealth, uh, being the planetary endowment of scarce matter and energy, and the complex and biologically diverse ecosystems that provide goods and ecosystem services directly to human communities. And ecological economics is not the first field to do this. In the 18th century, um, this type of work um, was seen among what was called physiocrats, who studied how wealth depends on fiscal terms. Specifically, uh, they looked at agricultural production. Now, um, this type of work was also done by some of the classical economists, like Maltes or Jevons or even Ricardo, looking at the role of land. Um, but in the 20th century, um, economics, uh, most of these approaches were abandoned. However, um, working uh, parallel to this in the 20th century and inspired by the development of thermodynamics in the 19th century were the biophysical economists. And these economists grounded their economic analysis in physical flows. They looked at the high quality energy which goes in as inputs into the economy and the low quality waste that is produced as an output. So in their studies, the flows of energy and matter were taken to form the very basis of the economy and they were at the center of analysis. Ecological economics today argues that the finite nature of our environment, um, shown by the, the picture uh, in the beginning um, does limit the economic system in important and significant ways. This kind of insights, it is argued, um, are lost by mainstream economics because both in their conceptualization, which I've shown, and their models, which I'm about to show, they leave nature out. And this leads us to one of the fundamental functions used in mainstream economics, um, namely the production function. Um, here we have the Cobb-Douglas production function, where Q denotes output, A denotes our available technology, uh, K is uh, capital and L is labor. 
um, and the exponents tells us um, how easy it is to substitute between the different inputs. You know, they're the elasticities of substitution. This function is important because all major micro and macroeconomic models of production are founded on um, this particular function. The problem, of course, with this function is that there is no environment um, and natural resources are not included in this function. Um, we basically have a factor telling us how efficient the technology is and then we have capital and labor inputs. Mathematically, what this function tells us is that the economy can get along without using any resources. According to Herman Daly, um, who's a well-known ecological economist, um, um, he called this, or, or said that this would be the same as um, baking a cake with only a cook and a kitchen, but with no ingredients and no energy, which obviously is impossible. And um, any natural scientist will tell us that we cannot produce anything without a certain minimum amount of natural resources, uh, in addition to capital and labor. So in reaction to this, um, neoclassical economics um, provided an alternative production function, which is this one. Um, it should be said that even though um, they did offer this uh, alternative production function. The first one is still the one that's used in almost every textbook. Um, but this one tells us that um, production also depends on natural resources, um, which is uh, the R. Um, the problem with this function, however, is the very form, uh, the fact that it's multiplication. Uh, it tells us that um, yes, if there's zero resources, then the output is uh, necessarily zero. Um, but even if we have a very, very small r, we can still increase q in this function just by increasing <coughs> capital and labor enough. Um, so basically, what this assumes and what neoclassical economics largely assumes is um, a quite big potential for substitution between the factors of production. Uh, meaning that if we don't have uh, as many natural resources available, we can substitute this for other forms of man-made capital. And going back to the cake analogy, um, what this function tells us is that, yes, we do need some ingredients to bake a cake, but we can still make the cake 10 times bigger if we just uh, have more cooks and a larger kitchen. Um, the reason for this uh, technological optimism, um, which characterizes neoclassical economics, might be that uh, they see resources not as very scarce, which has been true for a long time, and which was true even a uh, hundred years ago compared to today, where a lot of these ideas and uh, models were actually developed. Um, however, it's not true anymore. Uh, like I showed you in the beginning uh, with a picture of the planetary boundaries and how we have passed some <coughs> or are close to passing others. Another reason for uh, taking an optimistic view of technology is basically that our technologies have improved dramatically over the last hundred years, and a lot of economists assume that they will continue to do so. Um, but this is an assumption that's not necessarily based on reality. Um, the last point is that the um, mainstream understanding of scarcity in resources has been that when a resource becomes scarce, the price goes up, and therefore the market mechanism will um, 
will mean that the economy will come up with substitutes and that uh, production will move to other resources. Ecological economics um, sees it quite differently. Um, uh, in ecological economics, um, the biophysical aspects of the production process is taken into account, meaning that um, in terms of material and energy, uh, if you have outputs that require material and energy, that needs to be re reflected in the inputs. And more specifically, um, ecological economics sees the different inputs as qualitatively different from each other. Um, and they see the production process on um, being a, a process of transformation, the where the transformation is done by labor and capital, and on the other hand, on something that is being transformed, which is um, the natural resources. Uh, and the latter then necessarily comes from nature. And uh, in this way, um, the production process is presented instead for what it is, namely the transformation of natural resources into both useful products and waste products, where labor and capital are the agents of transformation and the resources are that which is being transformed. And then from that, um, physical realization, um, ecological economics argues that within the um, agents of transformation, uh, capital and labor, you can largely substitute. You can produce things in many different ways, using, using different forms of capital or technology or, or, or um, in combination with uh, labor. On the other hand, when it comes to R, um, you can also substitute between different forms of natural resources. Um, instead of making a house out of brick, you can make it out of wood uh, and things like that. So within each of these categories, there is substitution. But the important point from ecological economics is that between the two categories, uh, it's mostly a relationship of complementarity and not substitution. Um, and Ecological economics also realizes that an increase in efficiency can lead to a higher output for the same input of natural resources, but uh, ecological economics also emphasizes that there is a limit to this. Um, and in addition to this, it should be said that um, where uh, where a neoclassical economics says that you can increase input or output by increasing capital and labor, um, ecological economics also reminds us that even capital and labor itself actually requires material inputs. Um, we can't create man-made capital from nothing, uh, and we can't have laborers living of nothing. Um, the alternative ways of looking at these kinds of things from ecological economics um, would be uh, looking at the production process in a more realistic way um, in line with what I presented. Um, so this is not an actual uh, functional form because the functional form of this would be much, uh, much less smooth and maybe harder to write down mathematically. Um, the other uh, alternative is things like life cycle assessment where you look at um, a product from the very beginning to the very end and take into account the flows uh, and the material and energy requirements for that product. Another approach is <coughs> EROI which stands for energy return on investment that looks at not just the monetary costs of um, an energy resource, but looking at how much energy you get out of a resource versus how much energy um, you actually use to obtain that resource. Uh, and a lot of these things, or the AROI, has gone down for lots of natural resources. For instance, for 
oil, the energy return on investment is much lower today than it was a uh, hundred years ago when the oil reserves were readily available. Uh, another alternative is extended input output analysis um, where flows of material and energy is taken into account and then um, in general using thermodynamic analysis in order to uh, analyze the possibilities of actual substitution. So why is all of this important? Um, like I said uh, in the beginning, the scale of today's economy is causing significant environmental damage. Um, this is causing and will continue to cause direct harm both to our economies and directly to people's well-being. And going back less than 100 years, when most of the current economic theories were established, these environmental effects were still relatively negligible. Today, this is no longer true. Second, um, neoclassical economics does not take nature into account, either in its conceptualizations of the economy, um, the circular flow, or through its equations, like the production function. Uh, therefore, neoclassical production theory does not give a complete picture of production. Rather, it is a theory of the optimal allocation of a fixed amount of capital and labor inputs. This, according to ecological economics, is a major hindrance towards a more realistic picture of the ways in which the economy depends on natural resources. Furthermore, um, many of the differences between neoclassical and ecological economics are differences about the models uh, that are judged to be useful in explaining various economics and environmental phenomena, and therefore uh, predicting what will happen to those phenomena. Uh, and the point here is that um, it is difficult to answer environmental questions using models and theories where both nature um, and also distributional issues are either peripheral or completely left out. Um, and last point is that um, economics has very real um, consequences for policy, including environmental uh, policy which is used today for um, environmental regulation. Uh, and a lot of people are attracted to the field of economics because of its prescriptive potential. Um, knowing the material and ecological basis for economic activity is crucial to understanding the economy's impact on human well-being and should therefore be taught <coughs> at an undergraduate level of economics. Um, Ecological economists argue that um, all economists should appreciate that the material basis for economic activity is the natural environment. Um, yeah. I'm actually done, but <laughs> I can end this. Um, but I can continue to talk about some other things too. I think we can take questions and then. Yeah. I have a. <coughs> there are four questions, but they are concatenated. So, one question. Two. Two okay. The first one was it's, it's a really semantic thing that I found quite nice, but just to know. When you say ecological economics, literally, you are saying the same thing twice. One time in Latin, one time in Greek. Ecological, the study of the house. Economy, study of the house. So it's quite interesting that name, like repeating the same. Well, that was my first comment, nothing to do with that. The second one, um, I will ignore completely the issue about uh, distribution, because it's well different. So only taking into account uh, by all, all the biosphere and taking into account efficiency, I have these three questions. The first one, is why should, should we care about the limits of the world, the, the biophysical limits? And my question is it's related with a book of Amartya Sen, uh, First the People, is the book, is the name of the book, in which one chapter is called Why We Should Care About the Spotted Owl. It's a, a little bird that is 
going towards extinction, why shall we care for that bird? And <coughs> independent of his question, same question here, why shall we care about the environment? And just to forward look and answer, maybe we shall care about the environment because without the environment we will be dead. It's completely true. But in that case, why couldn't we just put it as a constraint in our model and look for efficiency? I mean, the model can be without the environment, dead, with the environment we can do something and then plot it. And that is because in your presentation you criticize a lot the Cobb-Douglas function. But the Cobb-Douglas is not neoclassical, it's just a Cobb-Douglas function. So for example, when you use a Leon TF function, the mean function, well the mean function tells you exactly that. Given environment, you can do things. Without environment, you can do anything. So it's strongly what you say, and it's also a neoclassical function. Um, even, even more, <coughs> when you talk about the e and other measurements, the e and the output-input analysis, well, the output-input analysis is also from the MTF. And the e is just changing the utility function by a utility measure in the efficiency of energy units. So, in theory, the same structure that the neoclassical uses is the same you are using. The only thing is that you don't care about yourself, you do a more social thing, and of course, you use another production functions because not only the competence is worthy, but which is like the really difference between ecological economy and not an expansion with better functions could be of the neoclassicals. Um, yeah, so, um, well, that was a lot of points, but um, one of the things that I didn't mention today was that ecological economics is a very, very diverse field. Um, it was institutionalized only in 1989 with the creation of a, a Society for Ecological Economics and the journal. And um, one of the key characteristics or emphasizes of ecological economics is on pluralism. So um, ecological economics sees itself as a very pluralistic field and it's not defined as a heterodox field. Um, ecological economics ranges from being um, basically ecology plus economics, meaning neoclassical economics. Um, this is <coughs> more typically um, representative of ecological economics in the United States. And uh, at the other end of that scale, you have people that want ecological economics to be a completely radical and heterodox field, uh, which rejects all of the neoclassical assumptions. So um, what I've been focusing on today <coughs> is a more biophysical aspect of ecological economics, which I think is something that um, most ecolo ecological economists agree on. Um, they all care about um, or think that material and energy aspects should be a part of the analysis, which is currently left out of neoclassical economics. And it's not that you can't necessarily do it, but uh, the point is that it is being ignored. Yeah, um, but I mean, that was my question, because one thing is to blame the actual students and the actual academic of not using completely the tool, and another thing is saying the tool is not useful for the analysis. Mm -hmm. So you say, oh, they are putting always T multiplying, we blame the academic. Why don't you put it additive? Why don't you put it with a mean function? But the, the scheme, the neoclassical scheme, this is still worth it. Another different thing it would be, I hate this method because this is this, and no matter the expansion, it will not be worth it. So I w I'm asking you exactly for that difference. What does it make you to have a different name and not just an expansion? Well, well, I mean, ecological economics, like I said, includes all of that. And it depends, depending on who you ask, different people that all call themselves ecological economists will give you very different answers as to what they think ecological economics is and what it should be. Um, so, so, I mean, there's no reason why you can't use um, those neoclassical functions <coughs> and still call yourself an ecological economist if you also then emphasizes or combine them with ecological models in order to actually take the ecological and physical aspects of the economy into account. Other, but then again, other more heterodox ecological economists, um, sometimes it's called social ecological economics, which is more um, representative in Europe and the European Society for Ecological Economics. 
and they will often reject those neoclassical models. And um, also in this presentation, uh, I put a lot of emphasis on how the environment produces goods and services that are important for the, the economy. Uh, the more heterodox ecological economists will usually reject the notion of natural capital because it is a neoclassical framing, whereas the more neoclassical ecological economists like this concept and thinks that it's important because it makes us, where it enables us to take into account um, nature. Whereas the more heterodox ecological economists will reject it because they don't think that you can actually find a correct price. Um, uh, ecological systems are far too complex to actually understand, and we should be much more concerned about uncertainty, um, <coughs> complexity, and feedbacks, and all of these things. And natural capital is, is, is a concept that's way too simplistic or reductionist to actually deal with complex ecological systems. Yeah, I mean, uh, in, in terms of what the solution to the problems is, I mean, that, to me it just seems realistic that a technological solution is really the only viable option because even if we say the West is over-consuming, so say we in, in, in developed countries we can find a way to redistribute uh, wealth more equitably and then reduce over-consumption to, to, you know, cut out, reduce the amount of consumerism and so on. I mean, what would the reduction in pollution and production be? 10, 15, 20 percent would still be a huge amount of production. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, whereas f for developing countries, you can really say, oh, please, don't grow, don't develop, because you're going to wreck the planet. I mean, uh, I mean that in my mind, that just leads to, to, the only, to the conclusion being that the only real way to, 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 to solve this is to find technologies which will reduce pollution and make uh, resource use more efficient. Or, or not. I mean, it's, there's a question mark at the end. <laughs> Wait, are you asking me about the solution? The environmental problem? <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. Um, <laughs> we need to have great conditions for paper well. <laughs> <laughs> um, I Well, I guess I, some of the points of, of the type of studies that... It, I mean, a lot of ecological economics is, is skeptical towards uh, economic growth, right? Because it, it, the, the, the argument is that, well, if it requires a certain amount of material inputs, then economic growth will, even though you can make it more efficient, it will still, um, you know, uh, include or use up too much material and too much energy, and we need to reduce the amount that we consume and so on. Um, but yeah, I don't have a very good answer to what the solution is. <laughs> oh, then. I'm just, I was just wondering how developed of a field, field, ecological economics is to the point at which we can adopt it into, you know, if that became the new decision side for environmental decisions, is it ready to kind of now come to the fore? Um, um, well, it depends, well, it depends what you want to use it for. Uh, there are certain parts of ecological economics that are more developed, uh, for instance, <coughs> carbon footprints, and that kind of analysis uh, comes from ideas within ecological economics. Uh, and they're quite well known today, I'd say, uh, in terms of an extra criteria uh, for how to measure our economies, like how much, how large of a footprint does a country have, and all of these things. Um, another thing coming from ecological economics, which again is, um, something that people really disagree on within the field is the notion of payment for ecosystem services. Um, the concept of ecosystem services was something that was pushed for within ecological economics in order to make uh, mainstream economics take the environment more seriously. Um, and that area of ecological economics has actually become quite um, um, it's, it's, it's used quite a lot, and there's a lot of research in <coughs> system services. Um, but then, on the other hand, you have a lot of ecological economists more on the heterodox side that disagree with this whole um, notion of, of payment for ecosystem services and things that, first of all, it's not um, 
it's not really fair. Um, we shouldn't measure these things in monetary measures. Uh, and also um, arguments like um, if we create this, this profit opportunities uh, within the environment or for ecosystem services, it could eventually lead to more destruction, not actually protection of the environment. Um, but there's, there's, I think because of the field is so pluralist, um, there's a lot of disagreement in it. So there is some sort of like a consistent kind of alternative or a consistent model <coughs> answer that you can sort of come to the table with. But there's lots of different bits that have influenced um, decision making or economics in different ways. I mean, I guess I understand what you just said, the insight of the main <coughs> insight it lends to mainstream economics is the idea of absolutes, which is different from most mainstream economic models. Then it's that none of these things are relative. It's not about relative gains. And I guess that's where the distributional question comes from. Because once you recognise an absolute, the question then can't be relative gains for everybody, it's you know, relative gain for one is a relative loss for another. And for me that's the kind of this, this theme that kind of the undercurrent that flows through all of what you say yeah, is so that if you and that's what the planetary boundaries stuff is about. The marginal focus yeah. versus the more absolute focus. Yeah, definitely. And the idea of you know, externalities, there is yeah, yeah. An externality. <laughs> and and also mainstream economics talks about, you know, value added to natural resources and to capital, whereas uh, ecological economics wants to talk more about, you know, what is the value of that which it is added to in the first place. Um, so yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. In terms of policy, economic, ecological economies consider policies such as incentives or or uh, pollution taxes uh, as uh, valid as valid policies or as still uh, too much linked to. Yeah. yeah. So so um, a lot of what environmentalists not discuss is uh, is uh, calculating what the right tax or subsidy. Um, should be based on maximizing total economic value and, and <coughs> based on um, monetary measures of, of the costs of pollution um, or the benefits of you know a clean environment. So taxes and subsidies, a lot of that comes out of environmental economics, which is a field that ecological economics is skeptical of, but um, it's not because they disagree with taxing. Um, uh, environmentally harmful <coughs> behavior or subsidizing environmentally friendly behavior. It's more because they disagree with um, the idea of finding a correct price on nature because there's so many unknowns and it's so complex. Um, and so, so it's more the, the sort of uh, assumptions behind what environmental economics does that ecological economics is critical of. Um, another thing is that uh, I think a lot of ecological economists would say that um, just treating the environment in terms of, or environmental problems in terms of market failures, so uh, meaning that it's it's about externalities, and then environmental economics is basically internalizing those externalities. Ecological economics would probably say that um, it's not sufficient to actually stop environmental degradation because it doesn't really um, question the the more fundamental structures of the economy and 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 like like the ways in which it, it sort of excludes or ignores um, the resource bases and, and production theory and things like that can really deal with that asking the other way around let's assume an economy that managed to be sustainable yeah so mm -hmm. perfect case sustainable in that economy shall we care for the environment I mean, given that we are sustainable, shall we care? If we should care for the environment, if we're sustainable. Um, to give you an exa a precise example, bullfighting, the bull. Mm -hmm. That bull is literally useless in nature. Why? Because it's already domestic, it cannot be put back in wilderness. And <coughs> being domestic is useless because it's step on the land and it's sterilizing. The only use for that bull is in the bullfightings, no more, literally. Mm -hmm. So my question is, I shall we care for that bull? Because his presence or his absence doesn't matter with sustainability. Shall we still care for him in, uh, in this context? 
I don't know. I don't think ecological economics has an answer to that. Um, I mean, ecological economics, the ways that ecological economics is similar to mainstream economics is that it, it takes an anthropocentric view of nature. And, 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 and even though a lot of ecological economists would probably agree that nature has intrinsic values and things like that, um, the analysis is based on the fact that environmental degradation is harmful for people. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't know how to answer that question. Mm -hmm. so. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I was going to ask basically you that you said that um, environmental ecologists criticise environmental economics because they don't believe about the pricing system and they think it's too complicated to have some sort of price assigned. Mm -hmm. So what's the alternative? Because you could come up with some price and you know, a, a, a distorted um, price is better than no price. Well, well that's some, well, then again there's disagreement. Some ecological economists uh, actually say that, well, maybe it will be useful to put a monetary price on nature because in that case, um, people would care more, or politicians would care more if there's a number on it. But a lot of ecological economists, and I think most ecological <coughs> economists, disagree with putting a price on nature. Um, instead of, of measuring it in terms of monetary units, um, they would say that you should measure it in terms of the, the physical units that it actually is. And using uh, diagrams like the one I showed in the beginning with the different, um, the nine, different spheres of uh, Earth and like how we have exceeded certain planetary boundaries. I think what most ecological economists would say is that we should keep those things separate. They can't be measured on the same unit. It's too, it's, it reduces the problem too much, which then keeps us from actually understanding it properly, which is a part of the argument for, for taking the more physical nature of the economy into account. I understand what you're saying in a conceptual way, you know, you're very conceptually nice to do all of this kind of stuff. But how does that you interface into the terms of what is happening in terms of current production, in terms of you know, manufacturing? And because there's no policy prescription that really seems to come from developing a framework like that. Well, I whereas, I mean whereas neoclassical, I'm not defending neoclassical as the whole thing, but it seems that it comes up as maybe not an ideal solution, but it comes up at least with a solution. Whereas if you come up with a framework which ecological economics is doing, it might be very nice to write a paper about it, but in terms of, you know, what difference does it make in terms of policy? Well, and the solution being pricing nature, I mean? Yeah, in terms of altering human activity. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, there is work on things like sustainability indicators and things like that that don't reduce them all to monetary um, measures. And there is there are people trying to push for this in policy that these indicators are used and that they're kept separate instead of reduced to one number. Uh, but yeah, whether it will I mean work or not, that's that's a good question. But yeah. Okay. Well. Thank you. Thank you.